Isaiah records, Sing, O barren one, who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your offspring will possess the nations and people the desolate cities. Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood. You will remember no more. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, for the God of the whole earth he is called. For the Lord has called you like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. For a brief moment I deserted you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing anger, for a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you, says the Lord your Redeemer. You can have a seat. So this is not the vision statement, but this is kind of a big idea. Big tents and redeeming love. Um, and re it reminded me, as I was reading through the initial part of this, amidst all the other things in my mind, I forgot to announce something really important. Um, Melissa has gone to the hospital with contractions at less than five minutes apart, so we may have a baby like, soon. She's has to get the dilate to send her home. Okay. Um, but they said to keep an eye on self and they expected that for the day. All right. So keep that in mind. Uh, we will pray for her before the close of the service. Um, and uh, when you get a chance, let her know you're praying for her. Share the excitement that uh, baby boy is on the way. Uh, a new member of that family. We're excited for it. And it should be a thing to rejoice about, as we read just here in Isaiah 54. As we're looking at this, I do want to remind us of the big picture that this exists within. We are all, every church, every believer, called to follow the greatest commandments, to love God and love neighbor. Jesus clearly explains that that's the whole purpose, what we're designed for, what the law was to guide us to do. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. The second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So that is the big idea. We are to love God and to love neighbor. We are also, in this theme of greatest, greatest commandments have the great commission, told to go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and I want us to recognize this is just the continuation of a theme that has been here since the beginning of creation. It is God's intended purpose and design that his people would be fruitful and multiply. It's the first commandment he gave. He blessed the man and woman he made and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. The earth is to be full, we put these things together, of people who love God and love one another. And making disciples is the accomplishment of that mission started in eternity past. Mm -hmm. So that frames the big idea for any church. When it casts a vision and goes about the mission, the big idea is to love God, to love neighbor, and make disciples. But that's generic. It is true, but in every specific place, with every specific People in every specific church, you have a collection of unique resources, gifts, passions, in a place with unique needs. And they need to live out that love of God, love of people, and the making of disciples in ways that connect specifically with who you are, and where we are, and who this world is that we're in. And that's the point of the vision itself, is to help the big picture of loving God, loving others, and making disciples make sense here give us direction to streamline what we do, to take every ministry that we're planning and check it against that and say, does it address these needs? Does it capitalize on our gifts and resources? Does it take what God is doing here and, and run with that following him? Does it let his plans, promises, and purposes 
be the vision for us that sets the direction that we run. So that said, I'm going to jump into the middle of what we read, verse 4 instead of verse 1, because I want to set some context for us. And as we go through this, you're going to find we framed this study of Isaiah 54 around four phrases which together form our vision. So the very first phrase of the vision is there above, in a broken world. It's recognition of where we are and what's going on around us. And I want you to notice that kind of language in Isaiah 54. He, he tells his people to fear not, for they will not be ashamed, be not confounded, they will not be disgraced, for they will forget the shame of their youth, the reproach of their wid widowhood, they will remember no more. You can go beyond these, this verse and look at the other eight verses and pull out of it words of brokenness. All of these things mentioned in Isaiah 54, 1 through 8 are things that do not exist in the normal world. We live in an abnormal world. It's just that that's been our normative experience, but that's not what it's supposed to be like. There should not be barrenness or desolation. There should not be fear and confusion, shame or disgrace, reproach or widowhood. There should not be desertion or people being cast off or anger of God towards his people or God hiding his face from them. All those things are mentioned here. All of them root back to Genesis chapter 3, to the introduction of sin to the world as man and woman decided that they could be God and they did not need God. And that started this terrible snowball effect where things have gone from bad to worse throughout the history. Thankfully, we have glimmers of promises, and we know the story of redemption that makes those promises sure. But these things exist. These are marks of a broken world. And we still experience these kind of things as well. It's not just Israel. You hear these words, and some of those are probably one you can hang your own hat on. Maybe you've dealt with fear, confusion. Maybe in the past, you know, you, you had or did not have children through difficulty because of the very specific ideas of barrenness. You know, there are people who have no children who wouldn't want children. You know, we, for a few years, had none and didn't know if we would. And then even after Charlotte miscarried a couple of times, not knowing if we had another. That kind of thing touches so many people. We should be able to connect with where they're at. But then if we look at, you know, shame, for our own sins, or maybe because of the way the world has labeled us, desertion. You know, we, we live in a world where brokenness is in almost everything. If we flip over to that, in our world, we have broken lives, individuals dealing with broken bodies, physical, broken minds, mental or emotional, relationships. We have breaks within families. You know, there's not a single family that is not in some way dysfunctional. And that goes all the way back to the first family with Adam and Eve. And when you read through it, there's no family in the Bible that wasn't somewhat dysfunctional. Even Jesus' own family. They rejected who he was. They thought he was crazy at times. They didn't believe him for a time. His closest disciples in that, that new family had their own problems. Adam and Eve, they had a son who killed another son. I mean, it, it starts in the beginning and it doesn't get better. Systems. In any recent election, I don't think I've really felt good about voting for anybody because there's no perfect leader, there's no perfectly applied power, there is corruption, there is oppression. And even in you know the, the best countries and government systems in a broken world, you cannot be free of the problems of sin. And then you know, just the news, whether it's the local paper or the TV, whatever comes across your Facebook feed, you see suffering, violence. I mean, my feed lately has been um, highlighting um, the persecution of Christians in Burkina Faso. Uh, particularly that's coming out because Heather's parents served there. She was actually, well, they, they were living there when she was born. And there are pastors, deacons, um, multiple places in the country over the last couple of months who've been uh, ripped out of their services, um, shot, killed, scattered in, in a place that has been known as one of the most peaceful places in Africa, and, and the place is nearly 37% Christian. That, that's a pretty strong majority in that part of the world, and yet there is violence, and I can't escape that. None of us can. We see poverty, pain, and ultimately death. It's unavoidable, it's inescapable. Some of you have been to funerals this last weekend. All of this is the result of sin. So the point of this is to highlight there is a need and there is urgency. We need to recognize that the world is broken and that 
cries out for a solution. We can make it even more specific, though. Here where we're at, Waldo County, many things you could probably point to, but here's just a few that stand out. 37% of homes here are single parent. That's a top spot to be in. Those people are trying to take care of everything in that household, from the financial stability to raising the children, and it's just impossible for them to have the time to do that. That, that is broken because it's not the original design. It's not how it's meant to be, and they're struggling because of it. We have opiate addictions, disease, and death. Uh, Waldo County is actually uh, numbered as a, as, a, as a watch location among the many counties in the United States for increasing risk of HIV and hepatitis C because of the opiate addictions themselves. Not to mention just the overdoses and the, the, the struggles and the death and what that's led to in families as money and time and emotion is spent on this. Uh, it's a destroyer. We have celebration of the confusion that exists in gender and sexuality in our world, um, highly represented in our community. And, and we have people, as connected as we may be by social media and all the activities we get involved in in the community, from civic organizations to bowling to stuff for our kids and sports, that are ever more isolated than they have ever been. In their own homes, people don't know each other, they sit at their tables and look at their phones, they go out to eat and text each other two feet across the table among the other people they're talking to as well. We live in a world that is broken. And it should not be something that we miss, but I wanted to point out to you that it is rampant and it's everywhere. And that should strike us and it should motivate us. But we were told you know, as we move on that that's not the end of the story. And so we move to the second phrase in the vision statement. So in a broken world, that sets the context. But our second phrase is, we will be the family of God. And, and that is set in, in that intentionality. This is what we are going to do. It is what we are, but we're, we're going to take note of that and actually be intentional about it. And you'll see as we move forward, the next phrase will take that and turn it outward. But here we look at the first chapter, the first verse of this chapter, where God, who Isaiah, commands them to sing. Or, depending on your translation, to shout aloud, to exalt, O barren one who did not bear. And if you had stopped right there, that's a head scratcher. What in the world do you have to celebrate if you are childless, your home is empty, and that was not your desire? He goes on and says, Break forth into singing and cry aloud. And he doesn't mean cry in misery and sorrow, but to, to shout huzzah. He says, You have not been in labor. Now we start to get why this might be a good thing. It says, the children of the desolate want to be more than the children of her who is married, said the Lord. Now, I thankfully have not and will never have to have had labor. But I can imagine that not having been in labor and yet having more children than anyone who's been married is a pretty exciting prospect. Now, Melissa has been, she's been dealing with contractions for months now, right? Um, and we've been wondering for weeks if she would come, if the baby would come early. And you're just hoping to get to that 30, what, 6, 37 week marker? 38. Okay. We wanted, there was a, like a hump we wanted to get past there and praying for. And, you know, unfortunately for her, she's going to have to go through the hard work. And that is not an easy thing to bear. I have watched that happen twice. And it is a terrible thing. Um, it, is, it is a good thing to be reminded by it that this world is not the way it's supposed to be. Even as you bring life and hope into this world, God has made it so that we do not forget this world is not right, that there are things wrong, and yet so we look forward to that change. But he's saying to these people, they're going to have a house full, and they don't have to do any work. They won't have the pain and the striving and the contractions and all that goes with that. The children of Desalon will be more than the children of her who is married. And I want you to get that picture of this just like hospital nursery with rows upon rows of babies. And, and God is saying this, this, this person, is actually saying to the nation of Israel, that is your reality. All of these will be yours and you don't have to work for it. Now, he's going back and he's, he's referencing Old Testament stories that have been repeated over and over. He's going back to the time of Abraham and Sarah. She was barren into her later years, told that she'd have a child 
well beyond the age of viability, and yet God miraculously does so. And out of that, God promises to bless them and to bless the nations and to bring forth a nation itself, the whole kingdom. So he's commanding the bear to rejoice and exult. And if you ask why those any of the children rejoice, it's this. He says, the desolate one without children who did not labor will have more than one who's married. God promises that the family will grow by benefiting from another's labor. They don't have to do the work and the labor and the suffering. Someone else is going to suffer. Someone else is going to labor. And they will enter into the benefit of that. That's the promise for them. And you've got to remember who he's writing to. This is to the people of Israel who are being dragged off into exile because of their sin. And who are being told, yet yeah, that they will return from exile because God is merciful. But they're going to see the armies of Syria, the armies of Babylon, level their cities and drag the people off and leave the wasteland behind. And yet he's telling them that that will not be the end of the story. They will come back and find that while they've been a scattered minority, they will become a majority. That there will be a filling and a multiplying, which is the fulfillment of the original commands and promises. And this is actually quoted over in Galatians chapter 4, this very verse out of Isaiah chapter 54. Paul, writing to Galatians, is telling them that they, they, don't, they shouldn't work for their salvation. It's this idea that they, they're trying to labor for it when someone else has already suffered, someone else has already labored. They don't need to labor through to become the children of God. He tells them they are sons. God has sent his spirit, the spirit of his son, into their hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave who has to work and to suffer and to labor, but you are a son. A son and an heir. And you don't have to work for your wages. You have God's will and testament given to you. That you are the inheritor of the estate of heaven. He goes on a little later and says, It is written that Abraham had two sons. One by a slave woman, because they mistrusted God and didn't see how he would pull up, uh, fulfill or pull off his promise. So his wife, who thought no children would come from her, said, You should have my handmaiden as a surrogate. And out of that comes the son of the slave woman. But then later, God says that son will not be the one that inherits the promises. It will be the one from your wife, Sarah. She, the free woman, produces another son. He says the son of the slave was born according to the flesh. The son of the free woman born through the promise. He's going back and saying it was God's promise that brought that son, not man's efforts. What happened was they re rejected or doubted God's promise and tried themselves. They labored and it brought suffering, not just momentarily to Hagar and the cross of labor, but to the family, as there was strife and contention from there on out. God says that's not the plan he has. He will bring about his promises for them on their behalf without their working, striving, suffering, and laboring. See, God has always planned to multiply the family, and you can go back to Genesis, as we've said, to find this theme over and over. It's there in the first chapter. When Adam and Eve was, that was what was supposed to happen before sin entered the world. But it doesn't change after sin enters. It's not lost, because then in uh, chapter 9, verse 1, after the flood, when God judges the sin of the world and the wicked, Noah and his family come out, God says to them in the very first verse of chapter 9, be fruitful and multiply. He tells them to go out and do exactly what he told Adam and Eve, repeats the original command. And then in Genesis 12 to Abraham, he says, basically, I'm going to multiply you. I'll make you into a great nation. And then very specifically, in chapter 15, 5, he tells them he's going to multiply his offspring so much so that he will not be able to number them. He takes them outside at night and says, look at the stars. And, you know, that's an amazing thing to go see. And then he says, start counting. You can imagine after a while, Abraham probably forgot where he was at. And God said, there, you're going to do the same with your kids. You're going to run out of numbers. You're going to forget what comes after, you know, by the time you have nine or ten or twelve zeros after that number, what is it? Trillion, quadrillion, you know, at some point you just, I'm sure that there's a label for that, but most of us don't know it. Abraham certainly didn't. God meant for him to just be astounded that his family would be uncountable, that God's power would be so at work in his life. And then you're in Isaiah. If you flip back just one chapter, Let's remember where Isaiah 54 is coming from. Isaiah 53 has set the stage for us. If you look back at this, this 
entire section of Isaiah is referred to as the, the servant songs, or the songs of the servant. We're told that this servant, we go back to the very first part of 53, is not going to be rejected, he's not going to be loved, he'll be rejected, even though he grew up before the Lord, he has no majesty to be loved or looked at, he's going to be in verse 3, despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, verse 4, he will bear our griefs and carry those sorrows, verse 5, he will be trend, uh, pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, upon him will be the chastisement that brings us peace, by his wounds we will be healed. Even though we've all, like sheep, gone astray and turned to our own ways, the Lord will lay on him our iniquity, our sins. He will be oppressed. He will be afflicted. Yet he'll open not his mouth like a lamb led to the slaughter, a sacrifice like a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. He was cut off from the land of the living. He died on their behalf. Stricken from the transgressions or the sins of his people. Made his grave was made, which, again, dead. Although he'd done no violence, no sin, no deceit in his mouth, it was God's will, the will of the Lord to crush him. This is God's plan to put him to grief and by his soul make an offering for guilt to see his offspring. Now there's a reversal here. This is one who has suffered, who has labored, who's done the work that God is saying they don't need to do. And he's done. And yet, despite being dead, you see here, that he's told he'll see his offspring in chapter 10. Now that doesn't make any sense unless there's something after death. The dead don't see their offspring. They don't celebrate their children or their grandchildren. This one, though, he'll see his offspring and he shall prolong his days. Despite having been killed and buried, he will see children come into the family and he will experience that and enjoy that for a long time, uh, technically for eternity. The will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he'll see and be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. So if God is going to multiply and make fruitful his people by doing the work himself and by making them righteous, by taking their place, suffering and dying for them, coming back to life and offering the power of life. So right there is the atonement, the power of the resurrection. This is a description of the work of Christ. Following that, they are told to sing, to shout, to exalt, to expect the family to explode, and as we're going to see in just a minute, to expand the house or the tent. It's always been God's plan to multiply the family, and he continues to do so through new birth. You see here in Ephesians 1.5, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. And don't feel left out if you are not a boy. Sons is a catch-all in Hebrew for all people. They pluralize it, and you know, it's not PC today, but it used to be that we could say you guys, and you knew we were talking about all of you, even though we didn't say guys and gals. You could say sons and daughters, that's exactly what it means. It goes on, it says, you receive the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children and heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ. And I do want to point out that not only do they choose sons because that is just a Hebrew way of catching both male and female together, but it's important in their culture. Because if you're counted as a son, whether or not you're male or female, you're given greater value. They're in a society and culture where women had little say, little power, little influence, who at some point were, were almost not much more valuable or powerful than the animals. For him to say you are sons is to say that you have that place of value no matter your background, where you come from, who you are, or your gender. You are brought into the family and put into a place of prominence, a place that the father looks at with joy. You are one that he takes uh, and, and puts high esteem on. That said, we participate in this. God is doing the adopting by his spirit, yet we participate in the growth of the family. We see that because Paul and Peter both say that they have experienced that. We see in 1 Timothy 1 2 that he tells Timothy in his letter as he greets him that you are my true child in the faith. Paul sees himself as the spiritual parent to young Timothy. 
He brought him the gospel. He helped him to grow in following the Lord and mentor him and was to him a father in the faith. That's what you're to do if you have children is to raise them up, to teach them the way to live, to survive, to make their way in this world. Most importantly, to make their way into the world as God's world, to give them a spiritual heritage. Well, Timothy did that. Uh, Paul did that for Timothy. Evidently, it seems like Timothy didn't have a father who would. What we know is his father was Greek. He probably didn't know much or anything about the real true God. He couldn't give him that, but Paul did. Paul also did that for Titus. Now, they have no biological connection, but as just like with Timothy, he calls him my true child in a common faith. He has been raised by Paul spiritually to grow into mature adulthood. And then Peter himself does the same with Mark. He sends greetings at the end of the letter that we just concluded a couple of weeks ago, greets them from the church in Rome, but also sends greetings from Mark, my son. Now, Mark, we believe, is the author of one of the Gospels, may have been the unnamed young man who ran away naked that night in the garden when the guards assaulted and accosted and arrested Jesus. He traveled with Paul at a time, uh, abandoned them for an unknown reason, making a rift between them, but eventually was considered helpful, a co-evangelist in the work of the gospel by Paul himself, and probably largely because of Peter's influence as a mentor to him, as one who raised him in the faith, as a spiritual father to him. This is something I'm pointing out because I want you to recognize that being fruitful and multiplying is not, in a spiritual sense, about having kids. Now, that's one way to do that. If you have children and raise them in faith, that is the most basic and most natural way that the kingdom of God expands. And that's the way it should have happened in all families. If no sin had entered the world, that's how it would have happened. Adam and Eve would have had children that would raise them to worship and follow God. They would have had children and done the same, and there wouldn't have been any problems. There'd be no reason for Adam and Eve to evangelize their grandchildren or any of their nieces or nephews to evangelize the others because they all would have known God. They would have been brought up in that. We live in a different world, though, one where people have rejected God. They come from families who know nothing about him or who have false ideas given to them. And so evangelism is part of this multiplication and fruitfulness. It can and should happen within your own family if you have children, but it can and should happen outside of family as we expand the spiritual family by giving that same offer, that same help to grow in spiritual knowledge and maturity to those around us. He calls us to participate in the expansion of the family, to celebrate, to sing, to shout as the family grows, but to keep looking for greater growth and to be involved in it. Now again, we recognize God does the labor. It's his spirit that changes hearts, but he does that by sending out his word through his people. You are tools that he uses, just like his spirit uses the gospel presentation to take that heart from stone and make it flesh. We will be the family of God. So still the same phrase. The image changes a bit, though, as he goes from talking about children, verse 1, to a tent in verse 2. He says, enlarge the place of your tent. Let the curtains of your habitation be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. Now, this verse was taken by... Uh, William Carey, famous British evangelist in India, who really got the modern missionary movement started as he ex ex encouraged and exhorted the local Baptists in the middle of England to get busy with the mission of God. He used this verse and said, look, God has promised that the house is not yet big enough. We need to go out there and, and bring people in. He is expanding the family and the kingdom, and we need to be about it. And he took this image of taking this tent that fits the family now and making it bigger to make place for the family to grow. This harkens back to the Israelite wandering, and they were in the wilderness living in their tents as nomads. But the idea here is that a bigger family requires a bigger tent. It's an image of expansion. And so if you wanted to make it modern, since we don't generally live in tents, you might find that he would say to you, if, it was, if we were in their situation, build on an addition. Convert the garage to an in-law apartment. Purchase bunk beds to make more space in those bedrooms. And I want you then now to think about it in our context. What does it mean to expand the place of our campground site? To stretch out the curtains, lengthen the cords, strengthen the stakes? Why don't you look at the empty seats around you? If your head's not moving, you're not paying attention. Look at a seat for a minute. Pick one specifically. Just think about it. Those seats are meant to be filled with God's children. 
You know, the vision is not about church growth for numbers' sake. It's about church growth for the glory of God and for people's sake. If we love them, we want them to know and love God. Your spiritual children should be filling these seats. People who you could say, by letter or by Twitter or whatever it is, my true child in the faith. That is God's purpose. It's what his promises are. It is his very clearly described desire. That then should be our desire, our purpose, and here's where we get to the buzzword, our vision. Because vision sets direction, and if our vision is rooted in his desires and his promises and his purposes, then we know it's on track and it's actually going to work, because he is behind that and empowering it. But we want to make sure that we see that and we keep that before us. The point of having a vision is to make sure that we don't get distracted from what God is doing by what we're doing and think that we're doing what God is doing. But we keep coming back to that to make sure that we're on board with him. God has suited us for this task. And particularly the image of family is one we've chosen because one is biblical. But there's a lot of images for the, the people of God. It's the nation of God. It's the priesthood of God. It's the temple of God. Um, it's the body of Christ. Family, though, makes sense for a few different reasons. One, it, it, it fits Little River's atmosphere. It's something that we have experienced and loved the very first that we got to know you and that we came here. And it has been poured out on us and others. And by no means is it perfect. People still fall through the cracks, and we're still learning how to do this well. But that potential exists. That passion is here. And I've seen it lived out. We have open homes and open lives. Again, not perfectly, not everyone, but you know, I can count people who have opened their homes up to let people live with them, who are transitioning from one state to another, or who are between homes, or who need help. Um, they've opened lives up to share with them, whether that's meeting together at McDonald's for studies and prayer. We have a, a love and a care for one another, and we have a, a large number three, a fairly biblically mature congregation, people who care about the Word of God, who are well rooted in it, who have benefited from good teaching over many years. You know, I was so thankful to come into so well a foundation established. You know, many of the good things that are here are nothing I claim credit for. We inherited it, and I'm excited about that. What we want to do is recognize and build on it. And we have experienced families. And again, this is not everybody, but it is a core component. We have people who have lived together as husband and wife for decades, some of whom have raised children and seen them out of the home or who are on the cusp of that transition to empty nesters. They've not done it perfectly, none of us have, but God has given you that experience, not just for that time. That itself was part of God's plan and purpose. And in raising those children or in being spouses together following God, you have served one another, you have followed God, and you've accomplished things, but he did that for greater purposes as well. He doesn't give you resources or gifts just for yourself or just for a time, but always to spill over to others. Your experiences, learning to follow God, to fight fairly as couples, to raise children, even when impatient at times, to learn to forgive, and all of this is a resource. You are veterans in that, many of you. Combat certified. And we have a world that needs people who can offer that. You, know, you go back to statistics, 37% of the families of Albany County are single parents. Some of them don't know what it means to have a mom. More of them don't know what it means to have a dad. They need people who can help just meet basic needs. They need people who can help set role models. They need people who can help financially at times. They need people who can help emotionally. They need someone who can walk along with them and say, I've been there. I have my own share of screw-ups. God has been good. He's forgiven. He's led. And here's some things I've learned. And here is what Jesus offers you in this place. And we've got that. It's a resource we may not recognize, um, but I see that in so many of you. Whether it's you've got an empty room that could be used. You've walked through fire together and you can help others who are in the middle of that. Whether that's something that you know, they need to help coming out of or, or moving on the end or in the middle of fighting through. We have, uh, I think, a great foundation for bringing this picture of God and this picture of the church to a community that drastically needs it. And the issue of the family itself is behind so much of those 
problems, or so much of those problems affect the family itself. You know, the drug issue takes families and tears them apart, it makes it hard, it takes and breaks them. The confusion of gender and sexuality is a, it's an attack on the family itself, but you know, beyond that, it's an attack on the person. When the family falls apart, then the plan of God from the beginning that you would be raised in a household that honored the Lord and brought you up in it, you lose that too. So as the, the world dissolves and attacks those things, it adversely harms every person in the world itself. And yet we, we know that. We have the truth, we have the ability to offer to them this idea of the family of God. And so the challenge for us is that in a broken world, we will be the family of God. We are here to be the family of God for this place and this people. So now you've had this chair in mind that's empty, and I want you to take some of the imagery, the words that he used, and, and put that in place. Enlarge the camp by asking who's missing. And when you look at the empty chair, I don't want you to be thinking right now about who might be regularly here and traveling on vacation or sit, but, but who's not here that's never here? Who is missing from that chair that comes to your mind? And maybe it's someone that shares a property line with you. Maybe it's someone who's on the outside of the cubicle from you. Maybe it's someone that you bowl with or play tennis with or you swim at the Y with. I want you to stretch the curtains by imagining that seat full. And, and you know, if you happen to know more people, pick some other seats next to you, fill them up too. Lengthen the cords by speaking about Jesus to them. That may not be easy. You may not have opportunity. You may have to lengthen the cord. That means you may have to create that. That's part of what the Memorial Day barbecue thing we're doing this for. For us to spend some time, hopefully, with some neighbors and coworkers. We've got invitations out up and down the road for us and my 50 coworkers. They may not show, but we hope so because we want to build these relationships to be able to speak to Jesus. Uh, I encourage you, if you're coming, bring your own friends. You know, if you aren't doing something at your house, inviting them to it, invite them along with it. They don't have their own plans. That's time for them to spend with you, but also time to spend with other members of the family of God and to see what the family of God looks like. Because they're going to have a window of that moment into what God's family is like. As they see that fellowship and that love and that care, um, as they enjoy good food, but, but mostly as they see the friendship that develops from those who know and love God and have that love connecting them. Um, and finally, strengthen the stakes. I mean, the idea is you make this tent bigger and you stretch things out, you're going to need beefy stakes pounded in deep so the wind doesn't knock it over and doesn't fall down as you start filling it up with family. And that requires, really, the power of God. We can't strengthen ourselves, so I would say make sure that you don't attempt to do this in your own power. Now, it won't happen if you're not participating, because God has elected to save people through people, to use them to bring the gospel. But it's his work, beginning and end, to strengthen those stakes by praying for their salvation. Now, second phrase was, will be the family of God. Third phrase is, to our community. Because we want to make sure that we turn outwards. We're good at being the family of God. The danger of that is that we become internal. And we, we grow strong. And we mature together. But we become insular. Isolated from the world. Disconnected. Our own little monastery making no impact and no difference with no ripples. And while we grow, we miss God's mission. And even though we become more and more like family. And we think we would be becoming more and more like God we'd actually become further and further from him by losing that missionary connection because God is the missionary par excellence. He is the one who comes from a foreign land to this world, a culture very different than this. It's quite a step down. He comes from heaven to the slums, which is where we all live, lives here as the missionary to save us. And if we lose that, we lose the aspect of God that makes God known to us. It is something we can't lose. Isaiah says, You will spread abroad to the right and the left, and your offspring will possess the nations and people, the desolate cities. That's a picture of a city that just intrigues me. It's an island off Japan. They built an industrial complex, nothing but warehouses, factories, and concrete structures where families live in little homes. And for whatever reason, those industries are past and the place is no longer livable. It is a completely deserted island. It's technically illegal to go there, though you have people who enjoy exploring abandoned places and who will upload YouTube videos about that. You can watch them kind of run through this place hoping not to get caught by authorities. It's just falling apart. It is, in my mind, the picture of desolation. This once was a bustling place. Now, it doesn't seem to me like it would have been a very happy place, but it was full of people, a 
of life, of productivity and work, now it is a wasteland. Well, spreading out, filling a desolate is something God again has been about from the beginning. When he made the world, it was in its initial infancy, waste, void, a land unfilled and useless. And he starts making it stage by stage useful, livable, filling it with food for fish and birds and mammals, and eventually putting in people. But the world is still not done. He leaves them with that command to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill that earth, to take what was desolate, and to continue to do the work of God, to fill it with life and abundance and worship. Well, that's what he started doing with Abraham. He was basically rekindling mission. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth. It will spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and the south. And you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That's what he's been after all along. If you are familiar with the Old Testament, you go back to the Tower of Babel. That was exactly what was wrong. Is they were rejecting God's command to fill the earth with worshipers of worship. And instead they were banding together against God's command to make something of themselves. Instead to make something of this world and that God had made it. But I, I want you to take note of these phrases. Spread abroad, possess the nations, people the desolate cities. Again, remember, this is written to people heading to and then eventually returning from exile. They would see their cities fall to armies and probably look like that or worse. They would see their neighbors, their leaders, their family members dragged away and distributed among the wide world, far from one another so they could not rise up and revolt so that they would be forced to integrate and become part of the melting pot of Assyria or Babylon. And they would live in that godless land for generations. God tells them while they're there to seek the good and pray for it, not to forget him, they will be coming back. He tells them that there is hope that he promises. The scattered nations, going all the way back to the Tower of Babel, will be brought back to him. They will come and be made one, and again know the God that they have rejected. The empty cities that they've been dragged out of will be restored. People would be able to look at their nation and their community. Reading this, I mean, imagine the Israelites, either before or during their exile, or even in the first days they were back, just, you know, dealing with the potential of just being so overwhelmed with despair at what they have to do and the work required, they might just give up. But they've got this, and they start to work because God has said, this will happen. These places will not remain like this. They will be filled. And they'll actually not be filled by some of you, but by those that you lived among. You know, I'm going to do an amazing thing to take the godless you've seen and, and let them know me and bring them in. And these things will be filled by people of all cultures and all places coming back to the God who made them, who appointed them to worship him. And, and this picture is just amazing. Ezekiel says a very similar thing. Let the, uh, like the flock for sacrifices, like the flock at Jerusalem during her appointed feasts, so shall the waste cities be filled with flocks of people. Then they will know that I am the Lord. So the waste cities will be filled with flocks of people, but the flock is like the flock of Jerusalem for the feasts. That's a flock for sacrifice. That's a flock whose every member is dedicated to the worship of God to the point of bloodshed. Every one of those sheep will be slain as part of the sacrificial system to celebrate these feasts. He says the people of these cities, the city will be full of people who will worship God with utter dedication. They would go to the point of loss of life, shedding of blood for the God who has rescued them with their love. That is the picture he gives to his people. These waste cities, they won't just be rebuilt, but they will be filled with a people who know God to a degree that has never been seen and while this world belongs to the enemy, that is temporary. What is said to them is something that we can pin our hopes on, too, because Belfast, Northport, Searsport, Searsmont, Belmont, Lincolnville, Monroe, anywhere you're from, anywhere your families and your neighbors that you work with, they all belong to God. They are presently a desolate city. You may look at them and it doesn't exactly look at that picture, but spiritually, that's where they're at. Can you imagine, though, the day that those cities listed there, those towns listed there, are populated by the people of God. When everyone in those places is like the flock of God at the time of the feasts, dedicated to Him in worship. Imagine the day when worship rises out of redeemed communities around here 
and beyond. You know, don't limit your imagination when people are ready to sacrifice themselves. It's no longer needed. The sacrifice has been done, but to have that level of devotion. And finally, the last phrase, one relationship at a time. It's a broken world. There's a need and urgent. We will be the family of God. That's what God's plan and purpose and desire is, and it's what fits with who we are and the resources he's given us and our experiences. We'll do that for this community. We'll look outward to them on mission, and we'll do it one relationship at a time because that's an over whelming mission if you don't break it down. But here in Isaiah 54, the 5 through 8, the last verse, we're told, your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. The God of the whole earth, he is called. For the Lord has deserted you like a wife, deserted in grief and spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. For a brief moment, I deserted you. But with great compassion, I will gather you. In overflowing anger, for a moment, I hid my face from you. But with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Now, God had deserted them in this context by sending them into exile as the logical conclusion of the promises he had given them, which had come with warnings. Promises for their good if they followed him and enjoyed him. Warnings that by rejecting him and leaving him, they would send themselves down a dangerous and terrible path. And as they worshipped other gods, God said, basically, have it your way. That is um, a terrible place to be for God to say, try it without me. Because we are not meant for that. We are not designed for that. We cannot be that. I think at the root of most of our problems and sins is when we get that wrong. And we decide that at least to this point, we can be God. And we decide that we can set the bar a little higher for ourselves and take care of it and leave the rest for God. Now, for some of us, that bar is higher than others. For, for me, for a long time, you know my story, I left that bar at death. I'll be God until then. He can take care of the afterlife. And what got a hold of me was God actually allowing me to get some of my goals and taking away a few of them and basically putting me in a place where I realized that was a completely idiotic level to set that bar up. I have no capability to be God at any level in my life. There's not one plan or purpose that I can pull off uh, because as he clearly says, I don't have the power to stop one hair from falling out. We know that mission didn't go so well. <laughs> you know, we've got to take stock and be real. The bar that God sets is unattainable for us alone because we're never meant to live this life alone. It's all about relationship, which is why we're coming to that idea of one relationship at a time. God had stepped away from them. He says, you know, one way to picture that would be to be like a wife whose husband is gone. Now, of course, if you fill the picture out, Israel, the wife, had been adulterous. She whored after others. She'd taken the good gifts of God, sold them to pay prostitutes. And he lays that out pretty clearly in Ezekiel. They had done really wrong. And, you know, you can't fault God for stepping away from that. But what's amazing is he comes back and says, with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you. Can you imagine doing that if your spouse had treated you the way that you're treating God? Well, and hopefully you can because God has done that for you if you know him because we can't judge Israel without judging ourselves. We have also participated in the same adulteries by the very definition of uh, kind of a rhyming word, idolatry. Idolatry is just spiritual adultery. We have placed created things in place of the creator. We have sold him out for trinkets. And yet, in compassion and mercy, he's come back. Your maker is a husband. The Lord has called you everlasting love, compassion to the Lord, your redeemer. I mean, these are relational words. Israel had this intimate relationship with God. Sin broke it. He brought them back in love. He redeemed them through sacrifice. And we saw that here in Isaiah 53. That's what the chapter right before this was all about. It's him working to redeem them. Him coming back and suffering for all they've done, which he didn't deserve, to bring them back to what they didn't deserve, to him himself. That verse said, we read it. The will of the Lord was to crush him. He put him to grief. His soul made mountain for guilt. And he will see his offspring for long as days. The will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he will see and be satisfied. And here it is. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. So by knowing the righteous one, many become righteous themselves. He does the work. He has labored for them. 
and they step into the family and enjoy that without work and without cost. God, the Creator, just as God from Israel and in the Israel, offers that to His people all the world over here as well. That is a relationship for you, but not just for you, for all. For those people who you think, you know, who you imagine sitting in these seats. That is a love that never ends, a compassion that never fails. The Lord calls sinners into His family. He redeems the broken. That's what's been happening in us. They were broken. They were sinful. They had cast God off and abandoned them. And they had experienced that. We saw those words in the end, the shame, the reproach, the fear, the confusion. And yet he overcomes that and brings them back. He addresses the brokenness, bringing them into a family, creating a new community, a, rela- a community built around this relationship with God himself, with the creator, I mean, the maker, the God of heaven and earth, says, not, I'm too far away from you, I'm too holy for you, I am aloof and far distant. He says, no, I'm, I'm here, I've come among you, I've walked with you, I've suffered as one of you, and I'm bringing you in as one of mine. Second Corinthians, Paul lays this mission out, this call on us. He says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. That's that brokenness dealt with. The old has passed away, the old and new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself, gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. How? Well, Isaiah 53 told us he took those trespasses and dealt with them himself. He's entrusting now to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. So, the idea of the vision is driving to this action. Recognizing where we are, what's going on, what the need is, what God has supplied for it, and then doing something about it doing what he's called us to do about it, to be an ambassador. You know, we're not the reconciler ourselves, but we're the one who brings the news of the reconciler. We're not the ones who accomplish peace that we might pray for, but we bring news of the one who has dealt with the hostility and made peace possible. The Lord and your Redeemer. And the phrase, one relationship at a time, is, is something that I think really helps both with our um, encouraging us not to, to, to be overwhelmed, but also to be accountable. Uh, one is institutions can't have relationships. The church as an institution, as an abstract thing, can't have relationships. Relationships only exist between thinking, feeling people. A person has a relationship with a person, which means to be the family of God to this community, one relationship at a time, people have to be knowing, to be involved with people. People have to know other people, be able to talk with other people to be involved in their lives, pray for them, help them. So that requires us as the individuals who make up the church to grab a hold and do this mission because the, the church as an institution can't do it. We can't farm it out to someone else. We can't subcontract this work. It's ours. We are the ambassadors. And you don't have to do it all at once, though. One at a time. Now, maybe you're a high achiever and you want to take two or three at a time. That's fine, too. But the idea there is God brings people into your life for purposes. You know, we, we said just the other day that there is no such thing as luck or fate or chance. There's not a dice roll in Atlantic City or Vegas that isn't exactly what God intended it to be. You can't flip a coin without the heads or tails that comes up or it landing on its side without being exactly what God planned. Which means every person who crosses your path is there with some intention and purpose from God. And, you know, you may be the one who plants or who waters or who harvests as far as spiritual pictures go of salvation and evangelism and discipleship. But you have a part in that work of God. So the big question is, and this is the theme of our denomination um, under the current president, is who is your one? 
And that, you know, that idea is to remember the seat you looked at and the person you imagine sitting there, wherever you meet them in your life, wherever you encounter them during your Monday to Sunday, that person belongs there. They are meant to know and to worship God. Who is that one? That's the target for the mission for you. The one you are to be the family of God to. The one who are, you are to offer hope and help in the midst of whatever brokenness this world has handed them, whether of their own doing or they're experiencing at the hands of others. doesn't matter. We all have been there, still live in this place, know the realities and the travesties, and yet we also know the hope and the help and the power of God and we can bring that to them. So, if we break it down, we're going to love God, love neighbor, and make disciples in a broken world, and that's highly in the urgency. Being the family of God, which is directing our passions, our gifts, our resources. To our community, we need to make sure that we turn outwards, one relationship at a time, doable and accountable. So we're going to repeat this. We're going to talk through this. We're going to get to um, potluck next week after we want you to talk about this, raise questions or comments or thoughts, helping get this moving. Then Sunday, sorry, Saturday the 15th, when we spend time together that evening, we're going to be asking, how do we take this direction and put feet and hands to it, words and deeds? What does this look like in the ministries of the church? How does our children's ministry connect to this? How does a prayer ministry connect? What ministry teams do we not have that we might need to do this well? And which one of them are you going to join or to help with to do that? And we'll have time to pray for the people that you're going to bring Jesus to, who you want to see in these seats, and start thinking about what does this mean? This isn't a one-time thing. We're going to keep using this, talking about it. We're going to percolate in this, right, with good coffee, and make sure that we get saturated by it and become tasty, because we want this community to be affected by the presence of God here. So, in a broken world, we see brokenness all around. Our eternal hope is a heaven and earth made new in Christ, and we're going to proclaim hope in Christ to the broken. We will be the family of God. Christ is our Father. God is our Father. Christ is our brother. So we have an eternal home and family. We will be that family of God here for open homes, open lives, loving words, loving deeds, figuring out what that looks like and how we do that's going to be a brainstorm as we put you know, some marks to this. What's success look like? What do, well, how are we going to do this? This is the, the what and the, the why, and we're going to ask the how and the when. To our community, well, let's just make note, desolation means abandoned, deserted, without joy, without hope. That describes our community. I mean, there's people everywhere are thriving downtown, but it is still desolate in spiritual terms. There is no joy in Christ. There is, um, you know, it, they've abandoned the way of God. It's spiritually bankrupt. And ha yet, God has placed us here in this place for these people. So we look outwards and inward. Again, one relationship at a time. Recognizing people are isolated and struggling alone. That perfect love is found in God and comes from God to us, and therefore we will share that love with each person that God brings into our lives. Let's pray. Lord, as we close, I ask that this would stick in our minds, that this theme woven through Scripture would become a passion for us, that we would see what you love and care about, and that, that would become our love and our care, and that it would become our purpose and our vision and help us to do well what you've called us to do, to live out who you are in us to those who need it, and to see this community affected positively, changed by the offer of the true family they need, the family they were to, to be a part of all along, that there would be healing for brokenness in, in all of its forms, in individual lives, in families, in systems, in community, in society that the promises of the gospel, the yes in Jesus, would be able to turn those tragedies and those hurts into, by your restoring power, the ideals they were supposed to be. To bring out of waste and desolation, fullness and abundance and thriving. We pray that in your name.